I'm excited to share with you today the key points from my article in Canadian Family Physician, April 2021, Cancer Diagnosis in Primary Care. Hi, my name's Anna Wilkinson and I'm a family physician and an FP oncologist in Ottawa. Today I'm going to walk you through the best process to efficiently diagnose a cancer. We're going to follow a six step pathway that will cover all the things that you need to think about when a patient walks through your door with a concerning symptom. By following these steps, you'll get your patients diagnosed and into treatment sooner, preserving the doctor-patient relationship at a time when it's needed most. More importantly, as time elapses, cancer progresses, and so diagnosing cancer expeditiously means lower stage disease with the very real outcome of improved survival. Step one, history, or am I worried about this patient? Family physicians diagnose on average one cancer per month, but see many, many more patients with symptoms that could be cancer. The hardest part about being a family doctor is knowing when you need to work someone up and when you don't need to. It all starts with history. Some concerns obviously need workup, but it's the low risk, but not no risk symptoms that are the most difficult to triage. Vague symptoms like abdominal pain and fatigue are challenging. Use your knowledge of the patient, including smoking history, medical history, family history to help out. Listen for red flags like weight loss and systemic symptoms. Trust your gut. A recent study found that the positive predictive value of a family doctor's gut feeling for the presence of cancer was 9.8. And here's your pearl for history. Be concerned about those patients who represent with the same symptoms multiple times or have many symptoms at one time. Although a single symptom may not necessarily be predictive of a cancer diagnosis, the presence of more than one symptom or non-resolving symptoms with multiple presentations can increase the risk of a cancer diagnosis by 24. Step two, physical exam, or are there any signs of cancer? Use your physical exam to look out for signs of local disease, like breast masses, abdominal masses, lumps, or bumps. Regional lymph nodes can be really helpful in leading you to a primary. Also be on the watch out for signs of metastatic disease which may be present, like jaundice, ascites, hepatosplenomegaly, or lymph nodes. And your pearl for step two is that concerning lymph nodes are any nodes which are greater than two centimeters and hard and rubbery in nature. Step three, initial investigations or is there a problem? If you've found something concerning on exam or there's something you're worried about in the history, start with some lab work. Lab work can tell you a lot, like is the patient newly anemic? Are there signs of perineoplastic syndromes like hyponatremia? Or are there signs of metastatic disease like hypercalcemia or elevated liver functions? My pearl for lab results is always make sure that you have a creatinine, a CBC, and an INR on hand because you never know when you're going to need them for contrast CT or for biopsy. Once you have a sense of where the cancer might be, you need to confirm with imaging. You want to start with a test that has the lowest dose of radiation. So if you're concerned about something in the thorax, think about chest x-ray. If you're concerned about something in the abdomen, think about ultrasound. Ultrasound can be great for lymph nodes as well. If it's breast you're concerned about, think about a diagnostic mammogram and an ultrasound. If you're really worried about someone or have a really high index of suspicion, it is reasonable to start your imaging with a CT scan. If your chest x-ray or your abdominal ultrasound do show evidence of a, a potential malignancy, you need a more definitive imaging source before you consider biopsy. So those patients should go on and have CT. My pearl for imaging is that any CT that is looking for cancer should have contrast. Contrast increases the visibility of vascular structures, and because cancers tend to be very vascular, malignant lesions will enhance to a much greater degree than benign lesions. Step four, biopsy, or what is it? 
If your initial imaging is suspicious for cancer, you can't do anything more without a tissue diagnosis. The more tissue, the better, as there needs to be enough for histology, immunohistochemistry, and molecular diagnostics. This means that a core biopsy is always better than a fine needle asper. Ideally, you want to get the most tissue from the most accessible site, or the site that will give you the most diagnostic information. There's lots of ways to get tissue, either percutaneously or via procedure, like a mediastinoscopy, a bronchoscopy, or a colonoscopy. The way that you get your biopsy will depend on your specialist resources in your community and whether the mass is easily accessible or not. Some centers have a diagnostic assessment program to facilitate workup. If you have one of these centers, I wholeheartedly endorse that you use it because your patients will get expedited scans, biopsies, and access to specialists. One of the things that family doctors need to think about around biopsy is management of anticoagulation. If your patient's just having a skin biopsy, they do not need their anticoagulation to be held, but if they are on warfarin, you should check an INR to make sure they're not super therapeutic. For deep organ biopsies, on the other hand, anticoagulation does need to be held if possible. So if your patient is on antiplatelet agents, this means holding them for five days prior to the biopsy, while in a DOAC, these should be held three days prior to biopsy. With a patient on Coumadin, they should stop their Coumadin five days before the biopsy, and you want their INR to be less than 1.8. For patients who shouldn't be off anticoagulation for prolonged periods of time, you can think about bridging with low molecular weight heparin or referring to thrombosis for their advice. Thrombosis Canada also has an excellent perioperative uh, management tool for anticoagulation at www.thrombosiscanada.ca. My pearl around biopsy is the non-diagnostic or normal biopsy. So if you have a high index of suspicion and your biopsy comes back as normal, you need to consider that perhaps this is sampling error and not actually a normal tissue. In these settings, you can consider rebiopsying or following really closely, either clinically or radiographically, until you're sure that what you're dealing with is actually not malignant. Step five, staging or where is it? If your biopsy is positive for cancer, go ahead and refer to oncology. But the next step is staging. Staging investigations look at typical sites of metastases for cancers. By delineating exactly where the cancer is, the TMN stage can be determined, which ultimately dictates treatment options for your patients. By having these investigations in process or completed by the time the patient sees the oncologist can expedite your treatment. When you're thinking about where to stage, you have to think about where the cancer you've diagnosed is most likely to spread, and you have to think about the symptoms that your patient is having. Order a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, or brain imaging accordingly. Also think about MRIs and rectal and prostate cancers. Use contrast in any images you order, as long as renal function is adequate. PET scans or functional imaging may be ordered by oncologists or surgeons and select indications to determine if cancers are resectable. And my pearl for imaging revolves around CT or MRI imaging for brain. Which should you do? CT imaging is much easier to get, but MRI will detect two to three times more lesions than CT and 20% of patients with a solitary lesion on CT will have multiple lesions on MRI. Also, MRI will pick up leptomeningeal disease and cranial nerve involvement where CT may not. Step six, support in general health. Make sure you have regular appointments booked with your patients during their cancer workup, every week or even every two weeks. Use these appointments to make sure nothing's falling through the cracks and to review test results as they come in with your patients. You can make sure there's a clear plan of action that both you and your patient are happy with. These appointments also give you a chance to deal with any questions and manage any symptoms that your patients might have. 
There's a few key preventative issues to think about during a cancer diagnosis. The first is supporting patients in smoking cessation. Often, a cancer diagnosis can be a strong impetus to change and patients who weren't interested previously in smoking cessation may now be very interested. Make sure your patient's vaccinations are up to date as live vaccines are contraindicated during chemotherapy and patients may not mount an adequate immune response to inactivated vaccines while they're on treatment. Finally, make sure you think about fertility preservation with your patients of reproductive age. Chemotherapy can cause impaired spermatogenesis and premature ovarian failure. And so often young patients are rushed into treatment without the opportunity to think about fertility preservation. Refer your young patients to a fertility clinic so there's time for any discussions or procedures that need to happen before treatment ha starts and it's too late. So your pearl here is to book regular appointments during your cancer work. In conclusion, the six steps we've learned about today, history, physical exam, initial investigations, biopsy, staging, and general health will give you a clear path to follow when making a cancer diagnosis. The clinical pearls we talked about today are practical tips that should increase your comfort when working up a malignancy. I hope that I've helped you to feel more prepared to diagnose cancer in primary care and that you'll use what you've learned today to decrease the diagnostic interval for your patients and improve their survival. Thanks very much. 